Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to our second day of coverage of the International Remote Viewing Association and Monroe Conferences, or Monroe Institute, SciFest 2023, here in Charlottesville, Virginia. Our first guest today is Angela Thompson-Smith. She is the author of Tactical Remote Viewing. She is also a former research head at Bigelow Institute. I did I, not realize well, that was you not, worked at the Bigelow Institute. <laughs> well, I was not the research or head, not research, research head, coordinator. Sorry. Research coordinator. And uh, yes, and I uh, was there a couple of years. Wow. Fascinating. Yeah. Fascinating. I, I actually co sponsored the uh, International Association of New Death Studies with the Bigelow Institute okay. last year. Yeah. Uh, that was a fascinating yeah. conference. Yeah. When I worked there, it was the Bigelow Foundation. Okay. And uh, that was functioning for a number of years. Yeah. And then they became NIDS, you know, the mm-hmm. National Institute <coughs> Discovery, for Discovery Science. Science. And uh, under several other headings. Yeah. Yeah. Phen- phenomenal. Now, let, let's get into how, how did you come to the world of remote viewing, Angela? I, <clears throat> I had been skirting around the, the field of anomalies for many years. Mm. I had OBEs as a child. Mm. And many intuitive experiences as a okay. you know young individual, and uh, but then I went into more conventional areas: nursing, social work, mm-hmm. medical research, and it wasn't until around the 1980s that um, I realized I was sort of abandoning a part of myself that was more intuitive, mm. getting more into the practical research okay. areas, and um, I saw an ad in an old Omni magazine. I don't know if you remember Omni. Oh, I miss Omni. Yes. Oh my God, I that miss Omni great, magazine. great, great magazine. <laughs> and they were, there was a lab in Princeton, New Jersey, near mm-hmm. to where I was working in New Brunswick, New Jersey. Okay. Um, it was research. And um, they were looking for subjects for Gansfeld research. <gasps> wow. Yeah, they had a Gansfeld lab, which is a sensory deprivation yeah. setup so that people could more e- easily pick up telepathic information Interesting. from, <clears throat> excuse me, another shielded information yeah. Uh, location. Yeah. So I went, wow, okay, that sounds interesting. I called them and they, I went through their vetting process and yeah. uh, then I went down, down to visit. And I took, I did the fir- my first Gansfeld, which was they put you in this meat locker type mm-hmm. of setup in an, a comfortable chair. And you have um, all of your senses sort of dulled in a way because you have ping pong balls on your eyes, yeah. headphones on, a darkened room. Yep. And um, then you listen to some music over the headphones, calming, gentle music. And then after a while, the researcher who's outside says, okay, an individual now in another shielded room will be watching a video on the computer on the TV. Your job is to describe what they're watching, what they're watching, wow. or what you're picking up. <laughs> yeah, wow. And all of this was all sort of set out in the preparation and the, uh, but nothing about what we would be seeing. Sure, sure. So I'm starting getting these images flashing in my mind, and uh, your, the instructions start to talk out loud. And just describe what it is that you're going Mm. through your mind. I was getting all these images. And then towards the end, um, lights came up and four pictures flashed up on the screen in front of me. And I had to decide. I'd make a decision. First place, second place, third place, fourth place. Relation to what you were seeing. Yeah. And I saw this um, picture of a woman with her hair on end and the space scenes behind. And I thought, that is exact. That sort of really matches everything I'd been saying. So I chose that. Mm. And it was what the woman wow. had been watching, this, this picture on a screen in the other room. Wow. And it was a, like a, a beginner's luck kind of a thing. That is, that is incredible, yeah. Angela. And, uh, you know, what's... It, I, uh, I make binaural beat music, and one of the one of the things I speak about regularly when I'm on shows talking about my music is that before I found binaural beats, I had found the work of Gansfeld. Yes, and, yeah, and found Charles that, and, and I was yeah. probably in my teens when I actively okay. spray painted a pair of safety goggles, baby oh, blue, uh-huh. and just used a pair of headphones like yes. this with nothing in it to mute the world around me. Yeah. And, started yeah. seeing geometric patterns in front of my eyes uh-huh. and things like that. Yeah. And that yeah. was, 
that was really the first thing that, that I ever, first, yes. ever found that was like, there is something else going on there in is. here. And the Gansfeld research is still being carried on, like the Rhine Institute and oh, other wow. places. I did not yeah, know that. Yeah. But after a while, I'd been going down to this lab on my days off and um, taking part in their, ex, you know, the studies. They yeah. did other stuff as well. And then they, their funding was starting to dry up. Mm. So they then... They said, why don't you go over to the Princeton Engineering Anomalies Research Lab mm. at Princeton University and offer to volunteer there. They're doing some interesting parapsychology research in the basement of Princeton University. But, okay. Wow. Okay. And that appealed to me because I was already working in a university setting. Sure. Um, so um, I called up and I got a, a response saying, yes, you know, come on over. Lot, couldn't find the lab at all. Nobody knew where it was. It was down in the basement of the engineering school. <laughs> right <laughs> and, next to the janitor's closet. <laughs> well, <laughs> almost, <laughs> almost. So I found this, this door. They said, go to the orange door, and it has a trident symbol on the door. Um, but actually, it was just the shadow because the university had made them take it off. <laughs> So it was just the shadow. Just of, the shadow of the glue. Of the glue, yeah. So I went, okay, this has this looks promising. So I knocked on the door, and uh, they invited me in very warmly and uh, explained. They took me on a little tour, not a large lab. And when you walk in, there was a big orange couch, and then opposite was this huge pinball machine on the wall that took up the whole wall <laughs> with these ping po not ping pong balls but met metallic balls. Yeah. And that was for uh, testing random uh, patterns and the human intention on the random patterns. Okay. So they'd set it going and all these balls would come tumbling down like a pinball machine. Yeah. And the viewer's job was to shift. Try the, and the, influence the them one direction or another. Yeah. Yeah. So I met Brenda Dunn and Robert John and the staff. And um, they were very eager to have a new volunteer. And um, they, they were doing random number generator work. Oh. Um, so they had compu a computer set up where that generated random numbers mm -hmm. and displayed as a graph on the computer. And the op they, they didn't call us subjects, they were operators, because it was not a psychology lab, it was an yeah. engineering lab. And um, so we had to sit in front of it and try and shift the distribution from the of the zeros and mm. ones that came out of the computer okay i was fascinated yeah with this yeah and they were very very welcoming were, and uh, were you able to shift the ones and zeros Angela? i was wow um over time okay because it's a statistical process okay so at the end sure. of each session you'd get a score and you had to record it in a book and um, you know it had to be very very precise. So you had a set of, of uh, instructions that had mm. to be adhered to. And um, so on my days off again, my holidays, any time free time I had, I'd be going down to the pear lab yeah. as well as doing my research with moms and babies um, in uh, New Brunswick. Mm. And um, eventually, I, I learned that the funding, our our funding grant at um, the lab was coming to an end. And um, so I started looking around for another research job. And Brenda Dunn came that Christmas and said, um, I had a small party at my apartment. And she said, how would you like to come work for us, with us? So I was like, yes, uh, okay, yes, I'd love it. I took a big leap of faith. Wow. Yeah. The, um, at my regular research job, when I told them I was leaving, what I was going mm. to be doing, the um, professor in charge went ballistic. Oh, I'll bet. And he said, <laughs> you will never, ever work in academia again. You are ruining your career. I mean, he was just almost leaping this up. This is part down. of the problem. <laughs> this is straight up part of the problem. Yeah, yeah. So... <laughs> It was a little... I'm glad you were no longer part of the problem, Angela. <laughs> <laughs>
What's interesting is all of these people who work in academia, they also have private interests like numerology, oh, sure. runes, yeah. um, tarot, but they absolutely would never admit that in the academic yeah, world. Yeah. And, and, and yeah. It, 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 it's interesting. One of the things I've been talking about over the last many weeks is the recent uh, NASA hearing. The, yes. the NASA panel right. that, hand, that yes. happened. And, and the fact that the first scientist that got up to talk talked about how woefully scientists have not been doing their job. Yeah. They've been poking fun at people that research the 3 to 5% anomaly. And I'm pretty sure that's the job yeah. of scientists is to research the 3 to 5% anomaly. Yeah. I, I don't know if I would have ever passed chemistry with a 95% remainder and no. a 5% unknown quantitative. Right. I don't think that would happen. Um, so yeah, why why are we not exploring these three right. to five? Right. Well, it was taboo. It oh, was really taboo. And still very much is. And what's yes. what's really interesting, what's wild, is that this field. I, I go to yeah. a lot of paranormal conferences. Mm -hmm. I sponsor a lot of paranormal conferences. Yeah. This field, more than anything else, has so many people with letters behind their names, yes. Angela. Yes. So many people yeah. that are psychologists, psychiatrists, mm -hmm. physicists. Yeah, and I had my master's at that time. Yeah. And I went on to do a PhD later. Well, yeah, you were, you were a I nurse for years. Nurse, and, social worker, yeah. uh, researcher. Yeah. Yeah. And um, But I really wanted to do this, and I, I was so excited about going to the lab. And I ended up staying there five years. And um, I was basically, mm -hmm. first of all, an assistant to Brenda, to the lab manager. Um, and then... All of the staff were also operators. We all took part in the research as well. Yeah. Um, so, and um, so every time a new experiment came out, they had a crystal pendulum ball in a case, you know, and the operators had to try and affect that. Yeah. And then there was also a, a down fountain of water that was in a sealed box that you had to try and affect what they called the laminar flow mm -hmm. to, you know, make, the, make it wobble, wobble or, or decrease or increase yeah. according to a protocol. So we were all beta testers. Wow. Yeah. So wow. lots of different, maybe about a dozen different uh, studies. No. Let me ask you, you were mentioning earlier that when, when you were younger, you had many OB experiences. Yes. Yeah. Um, one, of, one of the, I think one of the issues that a lot of people have attempting OBE, attempting astral mm -hmm. projection, is getting past that, that feeling of falling, almost, um, that, that supposedly comes just right. before leaving. Yeah. You know, that... that where, where you're drifting off to sleep and suddenly you're slammed back into your body like, ugh, and jerked awake. Yeah. Um, and it's the fact of if you can get past that, there's a whole world of exploration. There. Absolutely. Um, yeah. How similar are your o were your OBE experiences? And A, do you still have OBE I can, experiences? I can still go OBE if I choose and, to, yes. And that's separate from your remote viewing Absolutely. practice. Absolutely, although I do incorporate some... Um, OBE work sometimes into my um, sessions. Sure, sure. And uh, when I'm doing CRV in stage four, there is a place where you can bring in more sort of stream of consciousness type okay. of remote viewing. Okay. So I'll do that. But as a child, initially they were just spontaneous. Okay. And I would be put to bed in the summer in England. It doesn't get dark till about 10 o'clock. Mm -hmm. So you put to bed as a child and it's still light. It's still you think, daylight. I wasn't fair. And <laughs> so I would just lift up and I would go sit up on the roof and I knew that I was awake and it was very natural. And I'd go visit sure. my grandmother's house. I'd visit my head teacher's house that I was very fond of and um, wander around the village where I lived. I lived in Charhampton, England, in oh, Bristol, okay. just outside Bristol, England. And um, wander around and go down to the fields. And then I'd go, okay, I'm feeling tired. Now I'm going back to bed to go to sleep. Mm. And I would go back to my bed, come back in. And I didn't have the jerking, the slamming in. Okay. Because it was so natural. Sure, sure. Um, and then as I got older, I was able to control them and decide where I was going to go. Yeah. Have adventures. And um, for me, I thought everybody had did this sure that it was like dreaming but i was not i knew i was not asleep because mm -hmm. i'd come back to bed and i'd decide to go to sleep then um and i thought everybody had them and i told my mother at one time and she said 
oh, you've got a very good imagination. And I said, well, isn't it like dreaming? And she said, I said, everybody dreams. She said, no, um, you're just having imagination. Um, mm. Everybody dreams. And then when I started talking with other folks, um, they said, no, we don't do that. And mm. I discovered that very, very few people had out-of-body experiences. Yeah. And it wasn't until my 20s and 30s that I really began to research and find out what it was about. Mm. And that it wasn't just imagination, there was, really was. Because as a child, I'd gone, to, I said to my head teacher's house, and I saw this beautiful crystal cut grass, glass. Mm. And um, when I was talking to her one day, I said, um, and I told her I dreamed it because that was what my mother was telling sure. me. It was a dream. Sure, sure. But I knew it was, I was awake. I said, I dreamed I came to your house and I saw all this, these beautiful vases and cut glass and crystals. And she said, how could you know that? And I said, oh, it's just a dream. And she was open-minded enough <laughs> that she didn't poo-poo it. Or, sure. But yeah. I knew at that point that what I was doing there was, was something real. Different. Yes. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And it, it, that's remarkable. I, I, for years, did dream work. I, w yeah. I would go to sleep with intention to find something. Okay. Go down my path to my me meditation guide, and we'd go whatever. Yeah. Um, it's much harder for me to do that now. My brain is yeah. so busy for some reason. Um, and I've been trying to calm that down, but even, even in those times where I was doing that, yes, like you're saying, there was a very definite differentiation it's very between different experience. that and yeah. dreaming. Yes. yes. And, and even, even though I knew I was actively dreaming mm -hmm. and yes, able to influence those dreams, able to wake up, go back and continue a dream. Yes. Yeah. Um, but to know that, that experience is different than the OBE it's very experience. Very different, yes. Um, yeah. In what way? How do you how do you differentiate? Is it a is it a physical feeling for you or it's emotional similar, feeling? It's similar to a lucid dream. Okay. Is in a lucid dream you can control the dream, but you know you're in the dream. Yeah. In OBE, you know you're awake and that you're in your mind going somewhere and you can choose where to go. You can choose to change directions. You can go fly over things, you know, you can go down. Yeah. So there's a lot of self direction in uh, OBE. Okay. Some people, when they're just beginning it, just go where they, where it takes them. Yeah. Um, but because I'd been doing this for so many years, but then in the teens, I started perceiving in these OBEs, um, events happening to friends and mm -hmm. things I saw in the newspaper the next day. So the psychic stuff started kicking I, in. I definitely, I remember in college, um, I had n numerous dreams about friends that I told them about, like, hey, man, watch out for this. Yeah, yeah. Like, I had a dream about you last night. Look out for this. Um, yeah. And every once in a while, I will still have a dream I about a good too. friend yeah. and I will call them and they're like, oh, what's this about? I'm like, I had a dream about you last night, man. Just making yeah. sure you're okay. Yeah. But it, this scared me as a teenager. Oh, sure. Because I thought, well, perhaps my dreams, I'm causing something to happen. Yeah. Because as a teenager, I was still exploring all of these events. And, well, and, and uh, you know, yeah. that is definitely a possibility because uh, there is that concept of manifestation. Yeah, there but, is that concept of... Uh, yeah, you know. but I suppressed, <laughs> I totally suppressed my OBEs. Mm. And every time they started, it was like, no, I'm not doing it. Oh. And it wasn't until my late oh. 20s, early 30s... That you got back that to That I practice. got back to it. I was at Manchester University... I had finished my undergraduate degree in Cardiff in Wales, went to Manchester University and I was doing a, a research project and doing my master's. And they had some after, after university, after hours classes. And one of them was the outer limits of the mind. Ooh. So I was like, okay. That's this cool. Is interesting. <laughs> yeah. So we were all sat around in a circle and um, the topic was OBEs. I didn't know the term mm. out of body experience. I just knew that I had those experiences. So they were going around and one person said, oh, I, had, I was in this accident and I saw myself above floating and looking down. And um, then I slammed back into my body. And I thought, okay, that's interesting. 
And another person said, well, I had a fever and I was out of body and I was just wandering around and I could go where I wanted to go to. But then when I got better, it, it finished. And I thought, these people have had just one or two. I've had hundreds. You know, On purpose. And, yeah, on purpose, <laughs> purposefully. Yeah, I'm going to go now over, yeah, over yeah. there. Um, and I thought, how do I... Sorry. It's okay. <laughs> um, how do I talk about my experiences without invalidating their one. Mm, yeah. So, because as a nurse social worker, you, you become compassionate and, you well, know. Well, yeah, because you don't want to invalidate somebody's truth with your truth. Right. So, I, when it came to my turn, I said, well, um, I've had these experiences since childhood. And I didn't elaborate a great deal on numbers and things, sure. but I told them a couple of them. And I said, uh, I'm able to do this now by choice, that I can go and travel around. And um, it turned out there was another, it was a young man there in the class who'd also had multiple out of Oh, wow. Yeah. So we, of course, paired up and shared experiences and uh, compared experiences. Yeah. And from there, we formed, there was a group of the people who had attended. We formed a, um, a small group, explore, a, a, a sort of a research group, informal. Mm. And when they went off on travels or to vacations, I'd say, okay, when you're there, can I sort of come an out of body and observe and write down what I perceive, where you are, what you're doing? Nothing. And then you confirm it. And then when they back. came back, yeah, oh, cool. that they would tell me and I would sh we would share information. And I began to realize there was something very real about this ability that I could pick up information about a couple on vacation. I'd see the black and white dog that they saw every day. Mm. Um, the, the scene where they were, I had no idea where they were going. They didn't tell me beforehand where they sure. were going. So I was picking up information, valid information about where they were and what they were doing. So that, that sparked my interest. Wow. And I found a book by the one of Robert Monroe's first books um, before he actually started. You the know, Monroe, the Monroe Institute. Institute. How he'd spontaneously come out of body and it pricked his interest. And mm. how do I generate that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, for, to how do we be make consistent. that repeatable? Yes, yeah. So that really piqued my interest. And it was like, oh, here's somebody else who can do this. And um, so I went from there, then, um, you know, working in Manchester Uni University. And I came over to the States in 81. And I was married and divorced. <laughs> it was a total mistake. <laughs> but I stayed. And I got my citizenship and um, ended up in, you know, medical res doing medical research and... Um, uh, I did a few jobs before I got there. I worked as a, in a, a lawyer's office as secretary for a while and, okay. and finally got back into the research field. And that's where I found then the labs at Princeton. So, yeah. you know, there they were actively studying pre well, Princeton, the pair lab, the Princeton Engineering Anomalies Research Lab with Bob John and Brenda Dunn. They were studying precognitive remote perception which was basically um, OBEs for a purpose. Yeah. And um, so I acted both as a sender and a receiver. And the protocol was when somebody went uh, on vacation at an, uh, you know, a specified date and time, somebody at the lab, somebody connected with the lab, would do a, an exercise where they would try and perceive where that person was at that date and time, anywhere in the world, sure, unknown. Um, the idea being that not only would they try and pick up information about that person in the few, you know, at that location and that time, but it was done precognitively. It could be done a day before, a week before, a month before. Yeah, the person actually went to the location. And it was totally random. Wow. And um, they, what Pear found was regardless of the time the perception was made of that distant event, before it was even decided where the person was going, um, it was irrespective, it was significant, irrespective of, uh, irrespective of time and distance. Wow. So it didn't matter how far it was, it didn't matter, the time didn't matter. 
just the data. You could precognitively know where the, the person was And it wasn't was just me. Go. It was a whole bunch. I mean, I mean it was a big database Man. Of, of individuals. That is remarkable. Yeah. That is remarkable. And at, at what point, um, I guess that would have been your first intro into what would be considered remote viewing. Formal. Formal yes. remote yeah, viewing. Yeah, but it was called remote and, perception. And yeah, yeah, yeah. But we did know about, um, at the lab, about the work at SRI, mm -hmm. Stanford Research Institute, with yeah. Russell Targ and, and Hal Podolf and Ingo Swan. And in fact, Bob and Brenda had been out and visited that lab. Mm. And, um, you know, to just this coll collegial kind of a thing. Sure. Yeah. Um, and um, and then around that time, I had one of my jobs was um, to well actually before I before I went down to Princeton, one of my jobs was at the in the research world the medical research world was perusing through what we called current contents, which okay. were little booklets that were put out once yeah. a month with all of the current research that was going on. Yeah. And I happened to come across the IEEE paper written by um, in, uh, Russell Targ and Hal Putoff. And I thought, okay, so I sent off for a reprint to America. Mm. And it finally came back actually while I was down in Princeton. And um, there was, a, you know, it was a revelation for me because their quote in the beginning was what we used to call... Um, Traveling clairvoyance, exteriorization, astral projection, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, we are now calling remote viewing as a neutral term, yeah. free from association. Yeah, yeah. They wanted something scientific. And and isn't it funny how now it has so many associations? <laughs> <laughs> right, <laughs> right. But it, but it, it, yeah. Once again, to those who are uninitiated, it, it, there are many blurred lines there. Absolutely. Um, and I could see yes. how you could see remote viewing, even in its controlled sense, as clairvoyance. Yes. As, uh, as oh, precognitive, yes. something like that, which, which controlled remote viewing is not about precognition. It, unless it's, it's pre, um, unless it's precognitive, precognitive remote, remote viewing. Remote viewing. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, controlled yes. remote viewing, the yes. the military form, the very things formal, like that, the very protocol. formal scientific protocol yes. of things, yeah. um, is is not about that. And it's, they try and stay away from any connotations yeah. of paranormal or astral projection or because yeah. it's the the goal was to be as scientific absolutely, as possible absolutely so it was accepted by the scientific world yeah 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 precisely and i've trained in many different methods so well, and yeah on, on that note because you have trained on so many different methods let's start getting into tactical remote viewing in yeah. the book because um it, it's remarkable how many companies employ remote viewers like it you may not know this audience, but uh, like major corporations uh, employ remote viewers. But they viewers. do not talk oh, about it. Oh, they don't it. talk about no, it. They no. don't talk about it. But some of the contracts that I know people have are like, yeah. wow. Yeah. Wow. Um, it is really remarkable. There is even a person here who is a sponsor uh, that they use remote viewing in the world of uh, uh, high electronics and mm -hmm. and uh, new emerging technologies with power yeah. and things like that yeah. so yeah. Th it has numerous applications yes yeah yeah well i was approached in um 2003 by a, a businessman in new york who was into, a, he had a company that was sharing information to hedge fund companies, mm. and they also managed emerging technologies, and um, a very forward-thinking CEO. And uh, I, I can't say his name, and it's not anybody we know in, in the current world of business. He's passed yeah, yeah. away. But you still have NDAs that you've signed. So. Yeah, there was lots of, <laughs> yeah, yeah, there was very, a lot. And this businessman, um, he was going to work with another remote viewer in the field who actually dropped out of the field. She just got spooked, you know, with some of the uh, Prudence Calabrese. Um, you may not have heard of her with transdimensional systems. Ooh. And she, she just dropped out and um, decided she, she didn't want to do remote just, viewing anymore. Just too much. It was too much. It was overwhelming. 
And so she recommended me, thankfully to this client, and also for a conference that was taking place over mm. in England, which I attended, which was good, um, the field. And um, so I had a call from this businessman and uh, we discussed, you know, remote viewing, etc. And he said, yeah, I'd like to try a couple of sessions and just to see the quality of my work. Okay. So that, okay, yeah, that's fair. You know, if you hire somebody, you're going to, you want sure, to know sure. them. Because I had a reputation you gotta, anyway. <laughs> You've got to quantify the reputation. Right, right. <laughs> so we did a couple of, I did a couple of projects for him and he was pretty happy. And I said, I also have a team of um, other viewers that would be very happy to contribute. Um, it's called the Nevada Remote Viewing Group. Okay. And they were very happy, you know, they'd be happy to contribute as well. So for about... I suppose about six months to a year, we worked as a team. So he would send me, I would be the tasker and I would do my session first blind. Mm. I never knew, um, he would just give me like a, a, a heading of what he was looking for. And then I would go in, get the data. Most of it, I thought it was totally unrelated, but then I'd send it off to him and uh, he would say, wow, that was so helpful. And the data that was coming in from the viewers, the other viewers, the Nevada Remote Viewing Group, were, was helpful to him. And eventually he said, well, he said, I only want to work with you, to me. And he said, the other people I'm going to cherry pick who mm. I want to work with, because he, he was evaluating them Sure, too. sure, depending on task. Yes. Yeah. Task and talent. So I ended up working for him for nine years. Incredible. Yes, yeah. I was not only a remote viewer, but I was also a sounding board to him because I was non, you know, non-judgmental. Um, and this was unrelated to the, the remote viewing because those he gave me blind, yeah, mostly blind with just a minimal upfront. So then the recession came and I rem had remote viewed that uh, this was like 2007 at that time, 2007. Um, um, around that time, 2000, 2009. And I said, uh, I told him about the recession coming and he didn't believe me at first. He said, no, 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 everything looks healthy so far, you know. But um, it, it, it happened and um, he was even more convinced then, you know, that mm. remote viewing worked. Yeah. yeah. And we helped him through the recession through um, later on the selling of his companies because he had multiple companies. And um, then, uh, you know, I would guide him. He, what he would say to me was, tomorrow I'm going to a business meeting with the banks. I want you to go and remote view that meeting and come back and tell me um, what things I need to look out for, what I need to say, what sure, I need what are the decisions, curve the curve, but yeah. So I would do that for him. I mean, he, I, he really broadened my remote viewing repertoire. Wow. Yes. Yeah, because that, that is that remote viewing delve straight into precognition. Yeah, that is straight yes. precognitive yeah, remote viewing across the board. Yeah. Um, and they, and once again, there are numerous types: associative remote viewing, emotive remote viewing. Like, yeah. And yeah. It, all of these fall under an umbrella that is just, it, it's an incredible science. Yes. And yeah. I, I can't describe it as anything but a science. I'd love to say it's an art. It's very formal. It's very controlled. Um, and I, as I said, I worked for him for nine years. And um, the book covers, in the beginning, the f I, I give some of the early work we did for him just to show perhaps a new company that's mm. wanting to hire remote viewers, sure. the kinds of things that you can give remote viewers. Mm. And then the rest of the book are was the client's personal interests. Well, I'm, I'm sure it is very much uh, in the realm of where we are with AI right now. Exploratory. Where, where it's like, well, what would I use that for? You would be surprised. Yeah. You would be honestly surprised what you're like. I'm very good friends with the owner of Blueberry Podcasting, uh, Todd yeah. Cochran. And he he is one of the uh, people that puts on the podcast, the uh, People's Choice Podcast Awards. Yeah. And this is the first year that they, and as any 
voted award show would like to do, which votes are valid, which ones aren't. Who's using a spoofed email? Who wouldn't? Mm -hmm. Is somebody coming in and using 18 Gmail addresses and voting their show 18 times? They were for the first time ever. That was when you're talking two, three million votes for a show. That is a mountain of information to pay somebody to go through. Yes. Yeah. They gave it to AI. Mm -hmm. Three hours. Wow. Three hours. Yeah. They knew exactly which shows were uh -huh. voting for themselves. Yes. They knew yeah. like it dug in. So once you figure out what to apply the technology to. Yes. Worlds open. Yeah. Um, and, and fear drops. You yes. know, because yeah. once again, he could have hired a team of 20 people and spent $30,000. Right. He purchased yeah. a piece of software for a few hundred. Uh huh. And it did the work of 10 right. people for $30,000. Yes. Yeah. A remote viewer can quite literally do the exact same thing as Absolutely. a team of researchers. Yes. A single remote yeah. viewer. But you have to find a researcher that is not only trained, mm. but also practiced. Well, and you and yourself, skilled. and much like them, they have to task the AI properly. Yes. Your yeah. client has to task he, he you properly. He learned how to task Yeah, me. and you have, yes. to, you have to kind of coach them in how to task right, you. Right, right. Uh, how does that work? How does well, that process of coaching somebody who isn't a remote viewer? Because the client came viewer? and spent a weekend with me. I was teaching remote viewing at that time. Okay. And he and his wife came for the weekend, and they spent <clears throat> three days trying out different methodologies, learning about remote viewing, what it could be applied to, what it might not work with, um, and um, actually doing remote viewing. I took them through CRV, oh, CRV that's great. That's right great. up to stage six. Well, yeah, and, and, and they did well. Well, and like we have quoted Lim Buchanan, I don't know how many times in this, ep in this series of episodes, uh, anybody can be taught to remote view, not everybody has the most everybody people. has the psychic propensity. Yeah, there's the occasional psychically yeah. blind person. Well, yeah, yeah, occasionally. What he means is controlled remote viewing. Yes. Anybody can do yes, that. Yes, absolutely. And everybody has a psychic propensity. Whether or not you can flex that muscle mm -hmm. is a different story. Mm -hmm. You know, yes. yeah. um, if we all walk, we can all run. I may run faster than you naturally. Mm hmm. It doesn't mean that. Yeah, but there's still the ability. It doesn't to run. mean that through training, yes. I can't run as fast as you. Yeah. So, yeah. and and that's just it. It's interesting to know that you can take almost anybody. Yes. And teach them to do that. Yeah, because he they just came, they had not done any kind yeah. of intuitive work before. Barely, barely knew this stuff existed. Right, and um, came and and they were like kids you know they oh, were on vacation for the week i can only imagine for the weekend and came and uh and trained and they yeah. as i said they did very well yeah. but it gave uh the client an understanding of what you can and cannot do with mm. remote viewing well yeah yeah precisely yes. and and what boundaries they can take you to yes and which ones they yeah. should really stay away from yeah. Uh, yeah because it may lead to falsified information it may lead to a false hit how do you yeah personally know the difference between a hint and a hit i don't always okay i just trust the process all right and um i go in with um a tasking which is usually just a coordinate which is an alphanumeric address of the target abc mm. one two three sure um if i'm doing crv and i'll just launch into crv and trust the process that my subconscious will go to that address and get the information mm. and um related in the, the session I'm writing. Um, with ERV, sometimes there's a little bit of front loading. Mm. Um, for example, when I did the rings of Saturn, I knew I was going to the rings of Saturn, okay. but um, to look for anomalies. And what I found was a lot of anomalies that nobody knew about, but later when right. the probes went out there and started what? sending back data. Like what? Um, <laughs> <laughs> that there were these anomalous bodies within the the rings. Um, I perceived them as sort of mining craft. Wow. Um, and that was how I described them, that they were scooping up the debris. Chunks of ring. Yeah, chunks of ring, basically, yeah. Wow. Um, so, um, and um, <laughs> since then. Wow. 
<laughs> Those are all documented in my other books. And I, I don't think I put the rings of Saturn in that. Well, they're not in tactical remote view. And, uh, you know, this brings us to a conversation that I, I have regularly on the show. There, there, I belong to a lot of communities because of this show, Angela. Yes. Um, yeah. A lot of fringe communities. A yes, lot of, yeah. Um, and one of the things I've seen regularly here lately is people remote viewing past events. Um, specifically yeah. things like a Bigfoot attack. Yeah. These people were attacked by a Bigfoot. What happened? Um, right. Yeah. It, how does that work? Because uh, I guess I guess my question is, A, um, was it an event? Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know? Yeah. Um, and I guess that's part of their remote viewing process is to go and see, like, A, did this event actually happen? Yes. B, yeah. Uh, but yeah. When, when you're tasked with something that you already know, like you said, the rings of Saturn. Yeah. Knowing yeah. what the target is, how is that different from the controlled remote viewing process for you? Um, it's similar. Um, what I have to do when I get some minimal front loading is mm. to set that aside okay. and say, okay, I know where I'm going. I know the address. I know where I'm going, but I'm looking for new information, okay. unknown new information. Okay. That's, that's my goal. Yeah. And so I exclude everything else that I know about that target even and preconceived notions any preconceived and, notions yeah. any thoughts any it's just okay clean go to the target yeah and the only the thing in your mind is target absolutely okay yeah and that okay. takes discipline oh uh, yeah i imagine so yeah. i imagine so it's much more different than uh a it's different than controlled remote viewing which as you said is is a process and yes. when you trust the process it works yes follow the yeah. process ERV, ARV, these other things are different. They're, they're, they're a different animal than the controlled. They're applications yeah. of remote viewing. Yeah, precisely. Yes. They're, they're different yeah. applications of the same tool. Right. And yeah. it, now, as, as we wrap this up, um, what, where can people start, Angela? It's, it's a nebulous world, the world of remote viewing. Like myself, I think I'm finally interested in taking the step. Yeah. Finding, yeah. finding an instructor, finding a teacher. How does somebody find the right person I to work with? How do you find the right student to work with? Right. How can somebody prepare themselves to be the right student? Yes, yeah. Um, one, one of the major things I think people could do is, you know, I'm one of the found, original founders, part of a group that founded the International Remote Viewing Association. Yes. So go to irva.org, irva.org, and there is a way wealth of information there that will educate the first time viewer that has an interest. Um, there they will find the recommendations for uh, trainers, the work of trainers. Um, not all trainers are on there, but join the community, explore the community yeah. and find people who've trained. Don't just go with one person say who yeah. did you train with and we of course have the national uh, conference once a year yep. so come to the conference meet people ask yeah. them who did you train with did it did it work for you um and try and find a trainer who fits your personality if you're more a relaxed kind of obe -er type remote viewer go with somebody who trains in that kind of format. Mm. If you're a more analytical minded person, go for controlled remote viewing, which yeah. is a little bit more formal and focused. And um, does, left, what, yeah. does one maybe lead to the other? You can one open the door to another? Of course, you can go train in all, I've trained in many different methods. Sure. And I apply the method according to the tasker. If someone yeah. tasks me, I'll go, okay, I'm going to use um, a more stream of consciousness remote yeah. viewing for well, this. Even, even the fact of if they slip something in their tasking, well, I guess I'll be an ARV today. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I'll still do the task, but yeah. I guess I'm going to use this form of, it, of yeah. remote viewing or, today or because ERV of how extended remote viewing, yeah, which is a stream of, of consciousness. Yeah, because of yeah. because of how you've tasked me, this right. is now how I'm going to do it. Absolutely, uh, yes. even even though yeah. they didn't realize that. Yeah, I, I want to. And I try. You. you have to educate your clients. Oh, oh, oh no, absolutely, <laughs> yeah. absolutely. Like you said, to 
to train your client to understand yes. how to task you. It's yes, and, and not important. to front load you, yeah. overload you. And, you know, they might give like, this is a location, go to location, describe. Yeah. Or this is an event, go to the event and describe, which yeah. is very non-leading, but you, it gives you something to latch on to. Yeah. So minimal front loading is, a, is allowed sometimes. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Angela, I want to thank you so much for taking the time during this very busy well, this, SciFest 2023 to come and talk to us. I, I've got to have you on more regularly. This is an amazing conversation. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I've, I found the world of remote viewing when I was in my late teens, early 20s. I am almost 50 now. Yeah. It's taken me, it's taken me that long, but I think I got the, the, uh, the tape from... Mm -hmm. uh, the videotape from uh, SRI yeah. years and years ago, whenever I first heard about things on Art Bell and they'd run the ads for SRI. Uh -huh. And I was like, well, I'm, I'm going to call that. Yes. I'm going to do that. Yeah. And I think yeah. I still have the videotape oh, somewhere, wow. which okay. who knows how much that'd be worth now. Yes. Um, I yeah. could probably eBay that for thousands. Um, but to know that it's taken me this long to finally be like, hmm. Yeah, I think I might want to delve into that. Maybe something to uh, this. Don't let it take that long, folks. Seriously, get get into it if if you are interested. I myself uh, last year became a lifetime supporter of Verva. Mm -hmm. uh, Thank am, you. I am a sponsor of the conference. That is how much I believe in this work. Thank you. Um, I I love what you guys do. It is mm -hmm. absolutely amazing. The work of all you guys is. Just phenomenal, and it's great to see eyes turning to it. Good, um, yes. It's, it's and, really and great. Thank you to you for putting the information out there so other people could, people can become uh, educated about remote viewing. Absolutely, absolutely. Yes. If, if It's the only way people find out is to have the conversation. <laughs> I mean, that's why I have these conversations. Yes. Is that's the only way we grow as a humanity yes. is to sit back and listen. So yeah. um, let everybody know where they can go to get their copy of Tactical Remote um, Viewing. All of, all of my books are on Amazon. Okay. Uh, some of them are out of print. They will be gradually be rewritten. But the majority are there with Tactical Remote Viewing, Remote Perceptions, uh, SEER, uh, and other books that I've written yep. are all there on Amazon under Angela Thompson Smith, uh, uh, editor, uh, uh, author. <laughs> I have several titles. <laughs> <laughs> so author, Angela Thompson Smith, author. Or they can contact me at mindwiseconsulting at gmail.com. Fantastic. I was just about to say if somebody was interested in procuring your services for remote viewing yeah. or if they are interested in taking courses, where would they be go? be very so. happy to. And I have a website, uh, mindwiseconsulting.com. Fantastic. So they can go and look at that Fantastic. Too. I will definitely throw some backlinks on my website to your okay, website. Okay, thank, you. Um, thank I you. I am all about that so that people have resources and a place to be able to find things. Yeah. Thank you so thank much for you. your time today, Angela. Thank you. While you are online getting your copy of Tactical Remote Viewing by Angela Thompson-Smith, uh, make sure to stop on by CuriousRealm.com. That is where you can find all the episodes. That's where you can follow, like, subscribe. That's where you can find our store and actively buy Angela Thompson-Smith as well. Uh, stay tuned, folks. After these messages, <laughs> we will have continuing coverage of the second day of SciFest 2023 from the International Remote Viewing Association and Monroe Institute here in Charlottesville, Virginia. We'll be right back after this.